Good morning. I'm Mark Allen with Gaper, and I'm here today with Ido Levy, the CEO of Safe Mode. Good evening in your case. Ido, how you doing? Great, Mark. Thank you, and good morning. Good. Thank you very much. Yeah, it is morning here. It's 9.30 in the morning. Yeah. So to start with, can you share a brief background of yourself and your work experience? Of course. So I started, funded Safe Mode almost uh, three years ago, and prior to that, I served for seven years in the Israeli Defense Force. I uh, um, served as an officer, ranked as a captain in the uh, counterterrorism unit. Um, I managed groups of 15 to 20 instructors that reported directly to me in the area of combat fitness and Krav Maga, and we were responsible for units with 30 to 3,500 uh, uh, people. Uh, eventually, it's a little bit far from what we're doing today, but uh, a few uh, occasions pushed me to start the research and launch uh, Safe Mode. Wow, interesting. So <laughs> I've always been interested in Krav Maga. Maybe we could talk about that offline sometime. <laughs> yeah, we have uh, several overlaps. Let's uh, yeah. try to take it there. Are you fully trained in Krav Maga? Um, yeah, I I'm guess so. I didn't uh, train for a while, but uh, I guess that I'm fine. Cool. So uh, we'll, we'll get back to our topic, though. So what has been your experience with remote employment, both as an employer and an employee? Yeah, so, so I had little experience uh, prior to Safe Mode, but I think that now we had, uh, I had several uh, um, occasions, uh, mainly because, first of all, I've, I've based um, two, two year, in the last two years, I'm based in the Bay Area, where most of my team is back in Tel Aviv. So I had a very uh, um, interesting experience managing uh, my team and my partners uh, remotely, in not only remotely, but with very uh, um, weird and uh, challenging uh, different time zone differences. And obviously now in the uh, pandemic, uh, um, three months of the pandemic, all the company went uh, working for a, a remote, almost four months right now. Uh, we went uh, and we sent everybody to work uh, uh, from remote. So I have a little bit experience from that, I think. And I learned that... Um, while uh, working, I think that you need to choose the right people that uh, can co collaborate with you and to work with the right uh, company culture in order to make things right. I think that the company culture eventually should be very transparent and people should be uh, aware and we need to create a, a really good plan of what we want to achieve, how, what is the uh, roadmap and path to accomplish that, and to be very transparent one to each other on the, the progress, on the, the problems that you had, on uh, personal uh, issues that you had uh, along the, the way. And this is the, the way that everybody are aligned to the same uh, assignment, same uh, goals. Hmm. And, and you, you said you have an office in San Francisco. Do you also have one in Israel? Yeah, so I'm based in San Francisco and the R&D center of Safe Mode is based in Israel. So it's very challenging when they start their day, something like uh, 8 p.m. In, in San Francisco. And when I uh, um, start my day, it's something like 10 p.m. Uh, over there. So it's very challenging and we need to be very uh, sharp and we need to be very um, to plan things and to put uh, the right uh, um, meetings in the right times in order to make things uh, work. And as I mentioned, I think that the most important thing is the people. If you have people that are responsible, if you have people that uh, know to think outside of the box and know to take ownership on processes, this is one of the, the main uh, factors that will decide if you can succeed or, or not. Yeah, I would agree with that. So what do you think is the future of remote employment and what do you think can be done differently to make it more effective? Great question. Uh, I think that uh, eventually a lot of, uh, and, and now that we are already four months into this uh, remote uh, experience, I think that a lot of companies will continue working uh, remotely. I think that you have pros and cons for that. Eventually, it's saving a lot of time, especially in cities like uh, the Bay Area and like Tel Aviv and other places when you can easily spend 30, 40 or 60 minutes to each side. Uh, and it's a lot of time that you can save um, working from home. So I think it's very good uh, to work from home, save this time and uh, free yourself to work more and to be more productive and be also more productive in your personal life. Uh, in the other end, 
I think that it's still important, the in-person communication. And uh, I think that the world starts trying to figure out how to make it uh, works. We are trying to, to make the um, meetings and in our calendars every day to sync with all the, the team members in specific the specific teams. But eventually it's very important to, to keep the open channel uh, between everybody in the team. Again, I think it's part of the, this uh, transparency culture that I've mentioned, uh, but it's not an easy task. And I think that this is one of the, the main uh, challenging uh, topics that uh, we and every uh, employer need to find out how to make it uh, work because it's hard to build a product um, like that. We are not, each one of the, the team members is not building something by their own. We need to collaborate and to uh, create something together. And it's very difficult to do that uh, with the remote communications. If you don't have a, an open line for communication and if you are not a, a really connected one to each other, and it's challenging. Mm -hmm. I agree. And we, you, you touched on traffic and as you know, traffic in the Bay Area is challenging at best. <laughs> Before yeah. pre-COVID, is that true in Tel Aviv also? Do they have traffic issues? Yeah, it's, uh, I think that it's even more uh, challenging than in the Bay Area. Really? That's hard to imagine. I mean, the only place yeah. I've been to that had worse traffic than here is LA. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm commuting uh, by a scooter, so I'm not really aware for the, the Bay Area uh, problem. I brought the scooter from Tel Aviv, mm -hmm. the scooter idea. So when I got into the Bay Area, people like ask me in the traffic, like, what is this uh, weird thing that you're traveling with? But now it's everywhere. Um, so yeah, but mm -hmm. it's the same problems. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> so what is the story behind Safe Mode? What, what's your product? Who's your target audience? All those things. Yeah, so eventually we build a, a software that helps fleet operators, trucking companies, public transportation companies to become profitable and safe with a unique approach of driver engagement. Um, I started Safe Mode after a personal tragedy of a closed uh, a person that uh, died in a road accident when a truck driver texted while driving and, and uh, killed one of my um, mm. one of the people that I know. And it's where at the same time that I few months before I left the army and I decided to start my research and seeing how we can create an impact on the world to make the road safer and to make sure that this, this situation won't happen in the future. And I started in a different way from what we're doing in safe mode and I pivoted into a safe mode after meeting hundreds of fleet managers, transportation companies, insurance companies, and eventually I understand that the missing part of the puzzle is the drivers. There are a lot of hardware solutions that focusing on the uh, fleet managers, focusing on optimizing the vehicle, but none of the solutions today work with the drivers, benefit the drivers, and, and eventually create a behavioral modification and improvement for drivers by working with the driver. And I met two professors that are now, uh, one of them is my co-founder and the other one is a partner in the company that made very interesting uh, research and studies uh, separately on the areas of AI and behavioral economics on how to change, how to use data and incorporate behavioral models to change driver behavior. And we took that and create a product from that. Eventually, so Safe Mode is a software layer uh, that collect data from all the devices, the connected devices in the vehicles. We are hardware agnostic. It doesn't really matter for us which telematics or cameras or vehicle you use. We collect the data and then we create incentive plans for drivers in the mobile app where the drivers actually get financial incentives and monetary incentives based on their uh, efficient and safe uh, behavior. So as much you as a driver, a fleet driver, you drive more safe and more efficient, you contribute uh, more dollars to your fleet, you actually get a part of that. So this is how we create a win-win situation um, that is farly uh, missing in our industry. Yeah, no, I have some experience in this industry and, and that actually was one of the missing things. I know companies that were trying to do it, uh, but it's difficult, especially, but you, I think the incentive part really does make a difference. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, I think that it's, the incentive part is, is one piece of uh, the puzzle of this, what we call behavioral economics. I, I wasn't fully aware for this uh, um, thing before uh, starting safe mode, but I learned a lot of uh, models and how to actually 
how our actual uh, human behavior works uh, a lot of time and I see that every day in our industry people think that uh, the human behavior is rational and if we'll give people more money or we'll punish them or we'll give them a score or create a competition the magic will happen and people will drive more safe and more efficient or we'll do other stuff but eventually it's not really working like that you need to create a lot of other flows you need to create fair assessment for drivers fair or for the users you need to connect and engage with them because otherwise they don't want to use your service so we actually uh, I think that the big pivot and the big uh, uniqueness of what we're doing is taking these behavioral models, taking these understanding of irrational behavior of people and how we can use that for our benefit and for the world benefits to benefit the driver, to benefit the fleet managers and eventually create a meaningful uh, product. Yeah, very good. So how did you incorporate the idea of remote working at your company? I mean, you had two offices, so you already had to have done it. Um, so how did you yeah. get from the start? So from the start, so we were still small uh, uh, company. It was me and my co-founder eventually. And then we start recruiting uh, people mainly in Israel uh, or mostly in Israel. Um, so it was very challenging. And um, so for one and a half years, we worked uh, in this uh, um, splitted uh, uh, form. And it was very challenging. We had calls every evening and every morning and I needed to be uh, um, very worked in a very uh, challenging uh, times in the night and in the in the morning to be able to be uh, um, available for these guys um, so this is but this is a little bit a weird situation I think that what's more interesting is how we are doing that uh, today and now we incorporated several uh, um, um, things to make it happen and um, my CTO and the R&D team are working all the day together we have an, an R&D meeting and product meeting every day and um, to speak about the goals of the day to uh, track the progress of uh, people and then we are speaking all the day when we have um, issues and we need uh, one to each other uh, we speak more than few times a day and it's challenging i think that this is one of the reasons that for us remote working is is indeed uh, productive but we still need the in-person communication and see one one each other uh, we doubled our team in the last uh, a few months uh, mm -hmm. so we recruit uh, additional engineers and data scientists which are new to the company and it's very challenging to start creating the, the company culture in this form. And everybody need to make the extra mile for that and think out of the box. A few weeks ago, we had, a, or last week, we had an happy hour that one of our engineers um, created and make some games. And we're trying to uh, meet once in a while. Um, so it's challenging. Um, and I think that the world will need to, to find the equation between remote and productive uh, work at home, but building the company culture in a form of meeting once in a while. And still, uh, um, I think that the in-person communication is somehow uh, missing in this equation yeah. so far for us. Yeah, so, I mean, we touched on the pandemic, which, you know, everyone had to go remote in mid-March. It, it affected pretty much the whole world. Um, did that cause any roadblocks or challenges that you didn't expect? Uh, the pandemic in general cost us, uh, make us uh, several uh, roadblocks. Most of our industry, we worked with trucking companies and with public transportation companies and deliveries. So they had very unusual uh, interruption to their business. So it was very hard to continue growing the business. In terms of the work, as I mentioned, we recruit a lot of people. So it was challenging, but we choose and selected these people according to what we believe are the, the characteristics of a person which is responsible, uh, taking, are able to take ownership for the process and um, again, responsible enough to push themselves and make them themselves productive as possible, even without sitting uh, uh, together in our office, which I think that not every person in the industry can do, uh, but we chose the, the person in our team also, um, according to that, we believe that all of our team members are um, mature and responsible enough to uh, align 
and then their interest with the interest of the company and we all in the same boat and we all know that if we will row faster we'll get uh, faster to our milestones and it really feels that it's uh, working yeah so and that that brings me to my last question which there's companies like gaper that help develop build and scale products you're you've already kind of got it yourself you're, you're doing development you're in israel and in in the bay area so you've got that model down but how important do you think it'll be for other startups that need to hire certain talent and they need to hire it in a hurry i think that uh, obviously talent is one of the the biggest factor of a company success uh, starting from the founding team and obviously for all the the other team members and the engineers data scientists products and and all the other important uh, key members um I believe that it's very important to recruit, especially uh, for us, um, and I'm not sure that it's uh, relevant for all the industries, but to recruit people that you already know. Um, some of the people that we recruit worked with my CTO in their uh, prior uh, positions, and some of them uh, studied with my friends in the, the universities. So I think that it's very important to get these first uh, um, round of connections and introductions to the, the people because eventually we want to build a specific company culture. Uh, in addition that we want to recruit the, the best uh, uh, talent, but we learned that uh, it's very important not only to meet guys and, or, or ladies in interviews, but to meet them and work with them and hear the reference on them from people that you are uh, familiar with. I think it's important for any other thing in your life, but. Uh, for us, it was very important, but again, obviously, talent uh, recruiting and hiring is one of the uh, most challenging uh, uh, tasks in the company uh, journey, and it's very important to, to make it um, in the right way. Yes, I, I would agree with you. Well, Ido, I want to thank you for your time today. Um, this has been very informative. I wish uh, Safe Mode lots of luck. I know this industry. I know it's, it's very important, the work you're doing. Uh, it does save lives. I can attest to that myself. And I know it's late there, so I'll let you get on with your evening. Thank you very much, Rick. It was a pleasure to speak with you. And uh, thank you. Have a great day. All right.